archives of Prasar Bharti presents the timeless treasure of golden era. We welcome you to our program. Welcome to Studio One. Welcome to Studio One. My guest today is truly an international personality. She was born in America and decided to pursue her dream of mastering the Indian dance forms. Today, she's counted among the global experts on Manipuri, Odissi, and Chow, and presents them to audiences around the world. Welcome, Sharon Lowen. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And I also would like to welcome this wonderful audience uh, who has come from far and wide. They come from various walks of life. And Sharon, they would, in fact, like to ask you a few questions and interact with you during the program as well. My pleasure. To start with, tell me, how did you get into this offbeat area of Indian dance? Because you, you grew up in Detroit, in the United States of America. The time when you were growing up, um, I don't think many people in Detroit knew much about Indian dance. Actually, they did. Uh, Detroit, which is um, a very international city because, as you know, it's the home of the labor movement. And because people from all parts of the world came to Detroit, there were performances from every part of the world. We were on the Sal Hurak circuit, and we had Uday Shankar. Uh, Rukmini Arundel got an honorary doctorate in the 50s. And we had the opportunity, as we do here in Delhi, which everyone may or may not take advantage of, to see the best dance, music, theater, puppetry, literature uh, from all over the world. And I was somehow very fortunate that uh, my parents were interested and made it all available to me. So, so even though they were not really involved with the arts? No, my father was a chemical engineer. My mother was his partner in business with a degree in clinical psychology. Difficult for her to get a job as a woman in the days uh, when she had completed her degree. But uh, they loved the arts. We came from a background that always appreciated it. And I also, we had family friends from India uh, who were a very unusual couple because in those days, 60s, as everyone knows, you had doctors and you had uh, some people in the sciences. This was a sculptor from Baroda. And so because of that, I had an exposure to the arts and culture through them that meant that when I did finally come to India, uh, the most senior visual artists were the only people I knew. They were my uncles, G.R. Santosh, Shankar Chaudhary, Shanti Devi, uh, Himad Shah. I was interested in the whole world. I understood that you can't wait till you're 50 to go and explore in case you might like to be somewhere else. And I also remember, for instance, seeing very highly sophisticated dance by Balinese dancers that they would not be able to do after puberty. So the concept that sophisticated arts comes later, I understood was cultural. But who was it that really inspired you? Who inspired me? I would say that my mother inspired me because anything I wanted to do, she said, write me an essay. So if I wanted to go to Mexico after spending a summer in Mississippi doing easy puppets with Head Start, she'd say, write me an essay. I wanted to go to Europe uh, when I was at university, write me an essay. And So did you write in your essay that I want to go and learn DC or Manipuri? That would have been insanity. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something that I strongly recommend no one attempt to do. You should definitely follow your passion. But, and I do believe uh, the best thing for young people is not courage, but naivete. If you don't know what you're up against, you may find that you've broken through barriers without knowing they were there until you look back. And that is exactly what happened to me. I came to India. I wanted to come to India. How would I fund it? A Fulbright. What would I do on it? Well, I've been taking some Manipuri classes. I'll continue Manipuri. 
Obviously, I'm not intending to be a Manipuri dancer, but it will be a cultural entree. And then once I was in India, I decided that I would stay a little longer. That's even though you had opportunity to go back to the traditional form. You, you were well, offered, I, I believe, some... I had a master's degree in modern dance. Yes. And when I left University of Michigan, uh, everyone from my pond did extremely well in the New York Ocean, going directly, almost directly, into Martha Graham, Louis Falco, uh, Jose Lamon, um, Nikolai. Everyone did very well, but if you know those names, you know that they're very eclectic. And while I was in India studying Manipuri, I had the opportunity to see all of the other art forms. I took a workshop with Kelu Babu, Guru Kelu Charan Mahapatra, without any intention of getting more than an academic understanding of something more mainstream. You're saying Odissi, Manipuri, and Chow are not mainstream, but in comparison, Odissi is mainstream. But did your degree help you in understanding other dance forms? Because you, you did a master's. Well, I don't believe that any certificates help anybody do anything. I think that when you get on the stage, you can't hold up a certificate. I think it's what you can do with it. However... It opens doors for you. Ah, uh, no. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think that your merit in what you do is what, is, is what creates the opportunity. What helped me was that when I was an undergraduate, and you know in the US, undergraduate is four years, not three, which gives you incredibly more options for a diversified education. I appealed to the Board of Governors and asked to create my own major because I have no idea now what I thought I was doing, but I clearly had a goal. I called it Humanities, Fine Arts, and Asian Studies. And that way, even though there was no Asian performing arts at the University of Michigan, I took all of the uh, history courses, philosophy, survey courses of Asia. I could take ethnomusicology and music. I could take arts of Asia. And in dance, I could take kinesiology, how the body moves. And I had all of my dance training, my theater. And um, so that actually was a wonderful foundation. Did the degree, and I go back to the degree again, <laughs> help you in any way understand and perhaps give you uh, the confidence that you had the basics in order because you did follow a very structured way of studying by the Western uh, methodology. And then you came to India and you studied the Indian uh, methodology and you learned from the Indian way, which is guru to shishya, to, right. to, to, to uh, I mean, the disciple. I would, I would say that um, before I quite say on the substance, Having the degree, although for a Fulbright, I did not have to have completed my master's, although I did when I came. It was very beneficial in the early 70s to be here studying Indian dance as a Fulbright scholar. Because in those days, otherwise I would have been considered just a hippie. Whereas as a Fulbright scholar, people had respect. So it gives and you credibility. It gave me a credibility by being a Fulbright scholar that was very, very significant. Um, my education was fantastic at University of Michigan. And I think that, yes, of course, of course, everything that I had studied was foundational. Um, the thing is that because my training, in, this perhaps answers your question. In in modern dance training, you are not learning dances. You're learning how to see movement, how to understand, and how to replicate any kind of movement so that you have strength, flexibility, control, etc. That meant that when I saw Meyerbunj Chow, even though I resisted because I did not want to be a dance collector, I saw that theater practitioners who have limited physical ability, but need movement, were so thrilled they would come and learn chow from NYU for like two weeks and think they'd gotten something worthwhile. So I thought, here I am across the street 
from this great guru, Krishna Chandra Nayak, let me take a few drops from the ocean. And I found that all of the training that I had physically prepared me to be able to do Meyer Bunch Chow, even though the genre is completely different in what you're creating with it. And it was interesting because, you know, the stereotypes of the athleticism of, of, of Chow uh, is such that many people would feel that women couldn't do it. And my guru insisted, bless his heart and confidence, that after I'd been learning for a year, that I present in Baripada to the other gurus to show that a female could do it. And I think like, I don't know when, 20 years back, someone said 20, 30 years, they said they were visiting in Baripada and uh, they saw the girls were being trained. And uh, the master said, well, you know, there was this American who came and we saw that the girls can do it. Because I said in ballet, we do all of this. Why not in Chow as well? I mean, one anecdote I have to give is that I have a daughter and up to a week or two before uh, as she was born, I was doing Chow and uh, Guru Krishna Chandra Nayak insisted that I come to the ballet rehearsals for his Chow ballet for Bhaitakala Kendra to demonstrate the steps. He says, I've got emphysema, I've had TB, I can show it once, but I can't keep repeating it. And these dancers haven't come for regular classes and they won't be able to pick it up, you've got to do it. And I was like, Guruji, look at me. And he didn't even see it. So I went and I demonstrated, but I fear that that uh, their focus was not on the steps. You know? <laughs> and does your daughter dance as well? Because she had a lot of training even before she was born. She did. In fact, while I was carrying her, Kalu Babu said I should charge half, half uh, uh, cost for classes to her. Right? Um, my daughter had danced. She had danced as Krishna doing a chow piece for uh, Durdashan National Program. She had studied Tambartanatyam and Odissi. And she uh, wanted to do Kuchipudi, but I said, you can't for a while, because it's right in the middle. They'll get mixed up. Um, she is very blessed that uh, she has a four octave range voice. She's uh, um, directed more plays in her first year at Sarah Lawrence than anyone else, but finally decided to go to SOAS for critical media and cultural studies. And now she works in partnership with my son-in-law doing market anthropology because it's more intellectually stimulating. But uh, uh, dance is in her and she knows it all. Tell me about uh, the difference that you see between let's say ballet and uh, Odissi or any of the Indian forms of dance uh, when you compare them to let's say Western or the other forms that you've studied. Well there's two ways to compare. Um, one is the strictly physical, which is of course that Indian classical dances and folk dances and all Asian dances are grounded. You're barefoot, you're on the ground, you're connected to the earth, which is also closer even to like martial arts. Whereas the Western dance uh, is more aerial. But more significantly is the fact that Indian classical dance comes out of a spiritual consciousness. Whereas Western ballet comes out of a court tradition that was an entertainment. Now, they all have roots in folk dances, which then evolved and became more sophisticated. But the, uh, the aesthetics and the beauty and the transformation of Western dance and Western music can achieve transcendental things without any doubt. But the focus of Indian classical dance primarily is that by having text, you are able to try to create a metaphysical experience for your audience that will give them more than entertainment, but will take them to another level of, um, of some kind of, uh, of shared but individual understanding of Brahman in a way. Now, obviously, that's a very grand ideal. But it's a wonderful aim. It's much better to be aiming for offering a darshan 
of something that's more infinite than just entertaining. But doesn't that also uh, put the additional burden on you to understand the religious context to Not to religious, the spiritual. No, I understand, but, <laughs> you, but, but there is also uh, a religious side to it in the sense that uh, it'll be difficult for you not to just uh, or, or to, to, to just completely put that aside, don't you? Oh, you don't need to put it aside. You mustn't put it aside. Right. You simply need to understand the universality of mm. it mm. because the inner world that we all share is universal. Mm. And when I perform Abhinaya yes. in the West or in India, it is Abhinaya that communicates. People think that in the West you should stick to pure dance because they won't understand. Actually, the pure dance becomes repetitive quickly to people who don't understand the form. Whereas the Abhinaya will take people somewhere if you've given them enough information to connect the dots and to go with you. So, of course, that is the fantastic thing. That's what I love the most. I mean, as you, because you did fantastic research about me, my forte is Abhinaya. And that's the reason I'm here, because I learn by going into the text. We all know about Hanuman, but if I'm going to dance in Sankat Mochan as the first non-Hindu, I need to look at slokas about Hanuman, and I need to understand them so that I can share them with an audience that says these slokas every day and that is going to give them a new feeling, a new realization, or an enhanced or an adding to it, as well as being understandable to someone who knows nothing. So you had to study uh, about Indra and Krishna and, and uh, the context. I didn't study anything. But you seem to know quite a bit about <laughs> it. You see, when you love what you're doing, I mean, look, your whole life is study. We're studying, hopefully, till the, till the moment that we die, if not beyond. But, but you're doing it uh, because it's interesting. The, you see, the obvious question is, if you don't know the languages and you're not from the culture, how can you possibly know what's going on? That's a very reasonable question. The answer is twofold. One, I'm just fortunate that I've always from childhood had a kind of empathy. So as I say, if you're doing Shakespeare and you're doing Othello, you ha don't have to have killed somebody to be able to know what Othello felt. That is the job of the artist, to be able to enter into it. Okay, That means that you have to, as anybody in theater or dance or art, you have to be able to see. And I did have that training from childhood that became intrinsic. So that when I'm with Kelu Babu and they're doing the puja daily and you're part of it, you know how it is that you do your different things. I might have done, not done it daily forever, but I have internalized it and understood it. The other part is the advantage that I know that I don't understand. And so I take the text, I learn connotation, denotation, general meeting, talk to Sanskrit scholars, Oriya scholars, whereas many other students may just go with the general thing. And I'll say, what does it mean? And they'll be like, well, something about, okay, Krishna, don't something. Okay, whatever. I mean, they, they, they have a general gist. But I will talk to a scholar who will say, why is that image of Krishna used in this poem, in this time? You know, even something like Lalita Lavangalata. I, when I teach my students, I talk to them about Sangam literature. I say, when you're talking about separation from your beloved, which is not tragic because it's not permanent, but you're missing this beautiful season because he's far away. This is where you have Baliatra. This is from Kalinga, where everybody went to go to Southeast Asia, and you're going to have to wait for the next season for them to come back. So you have to think of the era and the Sangam and what is Jayadev communicating to the audience from this. So when I teach Abhinaya, I say, first of all, you just have to understand the text and then you have to feel it and then you have to show it. Very simple. Simple once you've done it, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, the same thing uh, you did with your uh, physical training because you have to grow mentally, of course, but you've also physically keep yourself very fit. 
I believe you you exercise a lot and you you even uh, go to the gym, you 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 dance, of course. But does that sometimes worry you that uh, you have to be very physically you, fit actually, at all times? No, you're quite right. When I was 13, I made a decision that much as I love dance, I would not be a dancer because I thought if you're a dancer. You have to spend so many hours on being physically fit and able to dance that where is the time for all of those other wonderful things that are so important? And I continued my dance, but I also continued with everything else. And I think that served me because that kept me from being locked in to a classical tradition where if your arm goes one way, your head goes the other, and you know you can't switch it. Um, it was never my intention to be a dancer. I figured that I would uh, wind up in arts administration, running a program. Uh, I might be a puppeteer, do a PhD in puppetry. You might just go into law as your mother wanted you no, to do. No, never. No, never. Never, <laughs> never. But well, why, uh, why, why is it that you didn't want to do law? It's just something that I, I thought was quite interesting. Your mother really wanted you to be a lawyer. She wanted me to be a lawyer because I convinced her redneck right-wing lawyer that he was wrong about the Vietnam War. And she said, if you can convince him, then you need to be a lawyer. And my feeling was, oh, don't wish it on me. Because I would be what is now called a human rights lawyer, in those days civil rights. It would be a very tough life. I said, I'm not, not, obviously I'm not going to be a corporate lawyer. So it's just not my background. <laughs> I mean, I, and um, no, it never appealed to me. To be but during that period, when you went back, uh, I think 1980, uh, and you started teaching dance in America, mm -hmm. um, was it that people walked up to you and said, listen, what was that you're teaching again? And asked you to repeat Odyssey or whatever, and uh, thought that you were really offbeat. When I, uh, it's a wonderful question, when I went back to, to the States, I'd been here for five years, and I was in San Diego, Southern California. At that time, quite rightly, most people would not know the difference between Odyssey and belly dance. It's Oriental. It takes time to establish a name and reputation. I was teaching Odyssey and, uh, Odyssey and Manipuri, Fortunately, at that was a time when the United States had money for arts and education. And I wound up doing over 200 programs in schools in Los Angeles, uh, introducing Indian culture through Odyssey and Manipuri. And I also was fortunate to be performing uh, along the West Coast, up and down. So gradually, I felt that people did value the dance. They did know the difference. There obviously were the Ravi Shankar circles and places that were there. And when I'd worn out my costumes, I felt I could come back to India and learn more. However, while I, that reminds me, when I was in San Diego, one of our most eminent Bharatanatyam dancers came to perform in San Diego. And the reaction of the audience was, She's good, but she's not Bala, Bala Sarasvati. The assumption that audiences in the West are ignorant is wrong. The audiences who go to performances and know what's good knows what's good. People will say, I don't know the difference in the technique, but I know it's authentic. People know what's good. And also, for the theater-going audience, that means they're accustomed to seeing Bala Sarasvati. They're seeing Kerala Kalamandalam. They're seeing the best artists, not only from India, but they're seeing them. I grew up seeing the Bolshoi and the Moisei of alternate years, Jose Greco Folklorico. You're seeing the world's best. So you do have standards, even if you don't know the intricacies of style. <laughs> I'm going to open the house to questions Please. now. Anybody like to ask a question? 
in india whether it is spiritual or dance guru unless and until you have some foreign disciples how does it work for you <laughs> <laughs> foreign disciples well i have here one odia disciple in the back and i have another from kanpur and i have actually this summer i'm teaching workshops and i am quite amazed that one of my disciples is a tenured dance professor at the University of Kansas his wife is also a tenured dance professor they must be like unique on this planet you know he is here june and july in the heat of delhi just to take my workshops that's he's from the us then there's another student who's japanese that's here right now and then in july will come a student from Lithu oh there's another one from brazil and then there's an one coming from lithuania who else vishwanath who else is coming from where i can't remember christina from lithuania christina from lithuania you know in the winter they get their holidays and they come i tried to discourage silvana my student from brazil from studying with me long ago i said why would you come from brazil to study with me why don't you go to orissa well i mean he does sometimes but um the advantage to that western education is a way of uh, is a pedagogy for teaching that and also i was fortunate to be at an academic institution that was not political very inclusive appreciative of of many and so it is my great pleasure to have my students be happy and not competitive and support each other and so for instance one of my students who's here one the foreign students you know you're saying you're not a guru until you're you got foreign students the foreign student in lithuania brought him to lithuania to teach and another student last year from japan brought him to japan to teach so no my students are helping their guru bends and guru bais to also come prior to that when you were here as a school teacher in the american school do you think that period was perhaps a turning point in your life where you actually found india to be a place which you could make your home yes it was because the time that i was here after i'd finished my fulbright and renewed it for a second year went back and taught at university of michigan for the summer and then i came back and spent 3 years at the american school that meant that over a period of 5 years without quite realizing it i was shifting my eggs from one basket to another and i realized at the end of 5 years if my career is as a modern dancer what am i doing um but i was you know I, and i had said when i left us to one of my teachers you know do you think i'm making a mistake she said no because if your leg uh goes from um how many degrees is that from you know diagonal up to parallel out you can get it back up again with work um most of us have a problem with landing in a situation where we can't get out of it <laughs> getting into it is not such a problem so that's why with yoga and dance one has to yes, be very careful yes yes but you so did um, you ever get tied up in knots when you were practicing i actually am one of those disgusting people that was born triple jointed so it's like when i went to a yoga class the first time i did a half locust i just put my feet on my head you know i'm sorry um and uh uh however you know if you're flexible then that means you don't have that that strength so that meant it was very hard for me to do a double pirouette on the left <laughs> to stay straight long enough because i was kind of noodly but while you were here uh you of course uh found your way in india and you've been traveling back and forth you've been living here in fact uh now for a number of years Do you 43 for 43 right and did you actually find the early days as difficult and do you think now your adjustment is complete I'm not more adjusted now than I was then I was always 
adjusted. When I came to Delhi, I had the problems that a young woman has in any city. Where do you get thread? How much does it cost to get your things pressed? Uh, is it okay to go out when it gets dark if you need to go to the market? That's anywhere in the world. You have to sort these things out. And of course, it was so much safer then. New York was unsafe. Delhi was safe. There were a lot of things that I wasn't aware of, fortunately. But the thing is that I was dancing because I loved it. Um, I never, I mean, I, I feel very fortunate that I, number one, I never had a sense of entitlement. Um, it's my choice to be here. Whatever I've been able to do, I'm incredibly grateful for. But would you say you are, when I say adjusted, I mean, as comfortable in India today as you are in America? Or do you feel you're perhaps more comfortable in India than America? No, I'm, um, uh, for a long time, I mean like decades or whatever, I, uh, uh, first of all, for the first 15 years, it was never my intention to remain in India. You think of old leftover Brits, and you know, you never know what the future will be. Then I was comfortable both places, I was happy, and finally, the decision was sort of made by the fact that when my daughter was school age, I had to be in one place. And I decided that in America, each place you go to, if you have to start over and build, it's difficult. That in India, it was better to build, even though it was very difficult, I'd be building on the same base. I would have musicians so I could create. I would not be tangential doing something that's not mainstream. And I have been incredibly blessed to play a part in moving the tradition forward. I would have help, which means that instead of running and marketing and stuff, I could spend that time on other things too, right? I could have help. Um, and I decided that I would, when my daughter was basically starting second standard, and I couldn't move her back and forth. I thought, if I stay in India, I'll just stay as long as I'm welcome and doing something worthwhile. And my friends in academia in the West all said that that was a very bad decision because they said, you are up against an impossible ceiling that your already head is pressed against and you're wasting yourself and you should come back to America. And I always thought I'd go back and teach in a university. And then eventually all of those people said, you would be so bored in America. And you made the right decision. But I totally acknowledge that I've been very lucky and I wouldn't advise anybody to try it. Was it a very tough journey? Was it very tough for you, difficult? Life is tough. That's what gives you your opportunities to learn. Yes, absolutely. Even to learn how to tie a sari is difficult. No. <laughs> For some it is. Come on. There's <laughs> half a billion, approximately, half a billion people that can wear a sari. Yes, of course. But you see, they've been trained early. You took on this much later. I wore a sari when I was 13. Is it, how many girls wore a sari before they were 13? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it shows that you actually had uh, some sort of exposure very young, and perhaps that is what uh, drove you to learn more. No, you see, yes. So yes you, you were no. exposed to saris, right. to Indian uh, friends, to Indian music, to the fact that you would want to explore more about India. But I was also exposed to Europe, uh, uh, to Africa. I did African dance. Uh, I was exposed to the Far East. So would you say that your Indian journey has been more accident than design? I think if I put it this way. Sometimes people have a journey where you say, and I know you've been trying to find this because it's the easy way. There's an inspiration. I saw so-and-so. I knew that was it, what I wanted, and I went that way. For me, it was like this multicolored tapestry where there were all these many threads. And slowly, because you can't do everything, 
you let some of the threads fall away and fall away and fall away. And finally, you're left with these threads. And I am so happy that I have these threads, but it's not like these are the only ones that I've had. Would you call it luck? What's luck? <laughs> well, luck is when you're left with just those many threads. It's, it's called keep putting your feet forward Okay, what, what's good luck about it is that if I had had sense and it had a proper 10-year plan, I couldn't be here. I'm, I'm one of those crazy people that did what you call follow your passion. I didn't know I was doing that. I was just doing it. And so when I say my mother's my inspiration, it's because... In a sense, I knew that my mother was my safety net. You know, nobody wants to have to go home in failure, but it's certainly nice if you know there's a place you can go home, if you need to recoup. And I always knew that that was there. So that gave me the courage, I think. And also I'm from a generation in America where we weren't raised to be afraid of the wolf at the door. My grandfather, who escaped from Tsarist Russia, was a tailor whose four children went through university. He found it very difficult to understand why I would go to university and not get what you're all told is a safe degree, that you're guaranteed a food on the table. But I grew up in a generation where we somehow thought there would be food on the table, I guess, and that you could do what you wanted. And so you could go far, you could fly. But how important has recognition been for you? Awards and recognition of what you're doing? There's only one recognition that counts, and that's the audience. You see, as a foreigner, First of all, nobody considered foreigners as artists. People would somehow see me dance, and, and individual by individual, they would change their opinion. They would say, I didn't think it was possible, but that was good. I didn't think it was possible, but that moved me. I want you to do this. I was doing satellite TV, Manipuri, back in the 70s. And I don't know how this all happened. That's luck. But, um, the, the thing is that then, eventually, I created these Videshi Kalaka Utsavs because since I was recognized, and the only other foreigner recognized was John Higgins for music, so I said, let me put on a festival that allows these foreigners who come to India to actually perform in India before they go home with musicians to get reviews in India and for people to see that foreigners can be um, uh, artists as well. And you realize that early on, that publicity is very important. When your brother told you uh, to, to get to the New York Times and he get an article. He said he wouldn't take me seriously until he saw my review in the New York Times. And you did get reviewed in the New of York Times. Of course I did. And would you say that was that's a turning luck. point? No. But that's luck. You, you now, accept that that is luck. You see, look, in the arts, I'm sorry, one of my students is here who wants to do a program to which he thinks will be the turning point. In the arts, there's no turning point. Every program is, that's it. Those people are there, 25, 2,500. It doesn't make you or break you. So if you hadn't got that New York Times article, you feel oh, it, wouldn't it, have made, it wouldn't have made much of a difference. No, but it did just, it help my, you? my just brother would have sneered at me a while longer. <laughs> that's all. But don't you think Articles like that and uh, recognition that you get through awards gives you the credibility to do uh, different things, to cut your own road. I, no, I don't. You don't think people take you more seriously if you, you, if know, you actually achieve something that I'll way? I'll give you an example that I give. There was a, and I know I have to be brief because we want to get questions. There was an Intec seminar on uh, intangible arts and the card of which I was invited to be a panel had Padma Vibhushan so-and-so, Padma Shri so-and-so, Kalamandalam blah, 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 these long titles, and then a big blank and Sharon Lowen. 
<laughs> so without any titles, without any awards, uh, without any awards, I was considered having something to offer to this discussion. And I frankly consider it, and I consider it a reverse honor. I am in Delhi and I'm a dancer. And I feel very proud to be a dancer living in Delhi who does not have a national award. And that you want to hear what I have to say. Okay, so awards is one part. The other part is money. You see, everybody works for something. And money is an important part. And when they talk of artists, they usually say, when it comes to money, rarely the twain shall meet. Is that true? Do you think artists don't make enough money? Or is it difficult for an artist to actually market themselves and make money? Well, first of all, artists aren't good marketers. Or the artists that are good marketers aren't generally very good artists. Um, um, I think, to tell you the truth, artists in India, I'm sorry to tell you, do better than artists in America. It's really, really much tougher there. But it's, you see, we are offering something that is not part of monetary value. I'm not selling you a tire that's going to hold up your car. How do you put a price on it? If I'm going to dance, what's it worth, right? What's a, what's a Picasso worth? You know, is it the value of the minute that he took to draw it? The half an hour that I took to dance it? Where do you measure it? Um, and everyone needs money. But nobody, nobody, not just artists, nobody does what they do only for money, except at unfortunately very base levels where you just need to basically survive. You know, nobody in this room is doing what they're doing for money, but you better get paid for it. Is it hard for dancers? Obviously. Nobody's going to earn a living just doing it. You have to do anywhere. You have to manage. You have to teach um, or write. Um, um, you do a variety of things, you know, I, and the dance is a part of it. Are you in touch with your friends uh, from college? The ones who told you that, listen, maybe you should come and work for the, Muffet, the Muppets or something uh, like that in New York? That wasn't a friend from college. That was Jim Henson. Mm -hmm. he, he was senior to me. I am in, fr in touch. You know, I used to say that it's like in India, I'm... I'm I have so many friends, and I'm part of things, and, and I, have, I have a very unique position, because everybody forgets that I'm a foreigner. It, but that's why I keep my accent, because I am who I am, and I don't want you to think I'm not who I am. Um, however, I came to India post-college, which means that all one's dearly beloved batchmates and school friends aren't here. I don't have those relationships here, and those are there. That's why I asked you. Yes. Well, this next summer is my 50th high school reunion. I will definitely be there. <laughs> and I am in touch with my college friends, and uh, there are visits and things. Yeah. What about the future? You, you say you don't like politics. You would like to continue working with uh, uh, the Center for Arts and uh, Without Frontiers and also with other organizations. But what are your plans for the future? I am a particularly non-ambitious person, which I think has served me. Uh, I have what I call a Hanuman complex. Uh, Hanuman, you know, he didn't know his strengths, but if you asked him to do anything, he could do it. Mm -hmm. So somebody says, will you be local producer for the CBC radio broadcast? Oh, sure, I'll do that. Will you, will you choreograph this? Sure. Will you, whatever it is. So would you say your secret is to first say yes and then find the way to do it? I will not disappoint anyone who asks me to do something. And is there anything that you have uh, taken on and realized, gosh, I have bitten more than I can chew? Most of the books I promise to do. <laughs> <laughs> because that's why I can do like an article every two weeks for the newspaper. But a book, the gun has to stay cocked. Mm. I promise by the end of July, I'll finish.
I'm going to open the house to questions Please. now. Anybody like to ask a question? Yes, but your name. Hello to everyone. Ma'am, it's a pleasure to have you. Sir, uh, my name is Vebhav Shavastav, and the question that I would like to ask is, it's already very difficult for artists to survive and make it through in a country like India, where already uh, glamour is taking over so much, and especially artists who are from a classical background. So what do you think, uh, f recounting one of the good experiences of struggle or perseverance, where you got through because of just struggle and perseverance, uh, if you could just tell the audiences and me, um, so that you know, it just inspires us that yes, these things do work in the real world as well. I think that in my case, you see, one thing that I was starting to touch on, because foreigners were not acknowledged and there was no opportunity, anything that anybody would do, publicity, meeting people, would have no value. So. I find that what happens, happens by, by chance, by being ready. So one thing is if you're an artist, always be ready, always be in form, always be cooperative. One thing is there are many talented people, and as you all know from most projects, people have a choice of talented people, they want to work with somebody that's good to work with too. So you have to be on time and responsible. When I toured in the States, Zakir Hussain said, I can't believe that organizer, Dr. Dix, is doing this. And I'm like, well, I have the same issues. How it happened, we never could figure out. The things that happen, but the thing is you have to be ready. We all have opportunities that come to us, and a lot of them we let go by. I look back at so many things that's, that I realized oh, I, I could have done that, I should have done that. I never send thank you letters. I don't keep in touch with people. I never networked. So that means I lost all of those things of people who had good feelings. I had good feelings. The best advice but is to be in touch. But the thing is, you have to be, it's not networking. It's being able to deliver. Do you regret anything? You just mentioned a few things, the letters you didn't write, the thank yous you didn't, you didn't uh, tell people, but any other regrets that you have that you would, th these are minor issues really, but any major ones? I can't think of anything major, but I think that's really major. I haven't, uh, you know, it's like for instance, I would be on tour and I would meet wonderful people and you know, you might take pictures and then you never send them to them. And then you spend so that's a promise years. broken that you feel. You spend years at night thinking, oh, I really should send those pictures to those people. And then you can't remember which ones were who. <laughs> and, and then eventually, if you wait long enough, they die. <laughs> so those are the regrets. Well, th those, are, those are major <laughs> ones. And the next question, please. My name is Raj. I come from a different world of performing art. I'm a sports writer. And um, in the world of sports, sometimes sports people criticize the journalists for being overly critical. They say, you haven't played any sport yourself, how can you criticize us? What is your own point of view, ma'am? Because you have been um, subject to criticism, subject to appreciation by people who have perhaps not even stepped on stage. What is your own point of view when it comes to criticism of art? Okay, that's a wonderful question. I don't think that a critic needs to have actually done the thing in order to be a good critic. However, the level of criticism varies greatly. First of all, it's a tremendous burden for a critic to have to be able to know every art form. None of us can be a master of that. So if you, for instance, know Bhartanatyam, you're not going to actually know about Odissi or Chow or Manipuri in detail. I, was, I feel very fortunate that in the years that I was coming up, there were a lot of reviews of arts in the newspapers. So aside from whether the critics are good or bad, there were reviews. Today, anything about the arts is combined on the local social page, i.e. page three. So whether it's a dance or an art exhibit 
or, or uh, a book launch, it's on the same page with a fashion show and a wedding and a polo match. So you see one there, that's a problem. Obviously there are critics who have their bias, everybody has their bias. I think that the people who read the reviews know what that is. And I think that critics have a responsibility to first describe what happened, then to offer your critique. And like with any other field, we have good and bad critics. I think the onus is not on them, but on the editors who should demand the caliber of reportage and critique of the arts that you get in sports and that ones for sports should demand from them what you would get in politics and economics. Because on the front page, they wouldn't get away with that kind of stuff. Yes, I just have one thing to add there that uh, when it comes to uh, criticism or advice, it's usually a pleasure for the person giving it, a pain for the person receiving it, and almost impossible to follow. This is largely true. There was a great critic, Raghava Menon, who was a music critic, who we remember because it was like poetry. And no matter who the artist was, good, bad, or indifferent, he always started out with the positive. And then he would say where there was room for improvement. And so he was never making anybody feel horrible. But he was honest. We have time for just one more question. Please. Hello, ma'am. Good to have you here. I would like to know, uh, do you believe, or in what, in your opinion, um, are, is the younger generation moving away from the classical forms and adopting the Western forms more? What would you like to say about it? I would say that the younger generation has been deprived by their elders of the opportunities to know their own Sanskriti. That your parents grew up watching Dudarshan and they knew the difference between Bihu and Kathakali. And, and, it is, and that is not available now on television unless you watch Didi Bharati, which doesn't get a mass watching. Things are available, but the moving away is not something that you've really chosen. It's because you haven't been exposed to it. And you have to make a considerable effort in order to find it and discover it. And this is really sad. And I would suggest that certainly anybody who has the opportunities to see things, educate yourself, discover it. Because, you know, I say this all the time, everybody does, as Gandhi said, let the doors and windows of your house be open, don't get blown off your feet. We all love things that are from all over the world. I'm transnational, I'm a global citizen. You have the right also to enjoy everything. But you see, when people say Western music, are they talking about classical Western music? Why do people always compare Western pop with Indian classical? Why don't you compare classical and classical and pop and pop? And why don't you get exposed to everything and enjoy all of it in its own time and space? Sharon, you've really gone deep down <laughs> into spirituality and reality. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us.